just to try to synthesize um, the kinds of things that um, we had or I heard today, and um, I'm not a very lateral thinker. I, I tend to think of or capture aha moments, uh, something that sparks an interest in me. So uh, I apologize in advance if, if what interested me doesn't interest you. And, and uh, perhaps um, one of the biggest ahas, I thought, was uh, uh, Ruth's presentation. I, I promised her that I wouldn't embarrass her in public, but I'm going to do so anyway. Um, and at the top of her poster, it says, why bother? Um, and I didn't feel, after um, being driven around in Ruth's bus, that the question was answered. Um, but it, it, the question for me is extremely relevant to what we're trying to achieve in the Learning to Innovate um, group, and I think that for a lot of the people in this room is essential to the work that they actually do. And the question, of course, is, is do we want to change things? And it was the only reason I got involved in the CG system, um, and it had a lot to do with the fact that the CG system operates under a banner that it says that it's a research for development system. And I, after three or four years in the system, have become very, very skeptical about that promise. And I think that Alan's opening slide of, of the unfortunate stick man pushing the big block of whatever it was, is, um, was a great way to, to, in fact, start off this session. And um, several other things that um, came up. Firstly, that uh, multi-stakeholder platforms um, are not, there's no such thing as a blueprint for how we actually do it. And I thought that it was interesting from Alan and, and Andre's presentations that they both used value chains as a structure within which they inserted themselves. But what is clear from it that was that the structure has sufficient horizontal flexibility um, that they can change and they can alter things as they implement and go along, right? I thought that was great. Um, I also thought that it was very important, this point that other actors might get involved in the process late in its implementation. And that's definitely something that we've experienced in the Mekong, is that this sort of snowballing effect as, as our reputation spreads, that people want to get involved. And I think that also Alan's presentation um, made that clear. I also thought it was very important, the point made by Andre, that at the beginning of the implementation, it's very project driven. You have to have a lot of goof and motivation to push this process along. And it's only really usually at the point when you're completely exhausted and you've lost all hope that um, it begins to pick up interest and uh, um, lots and lots of actors. I also think the point about the need to focus on perceived problems. Now, um, I risk uh, um, uh, a Donald Rumsfeld here in the sense that um, we hear a lot about this idea of needing to be demand-driven. If we're going to improve our impact potential, we have to address particular types of demands. But um, to paraphrase Rumsfeld, um, a lot of people don't know what they don't know, okay? So the, the, there is a role, I think, for a two-way dialogue between what research uncovers and the demand that policymakers or local communities um, might uh, actually generate. Um, I thought that Javier's session um, was extremely interesting. Um, he made the point of, uh, of clarifying what the difference is uh, between um, data, information, and knowledge. And I suppose that his, his ambition during um, uh, his bus ride um, was, was for the information that he was providing us to turn into uh, uh, knowledge. And I th that was also something that um, emerged in this discussion that we had down here, was, was that very often these kinds of concepts um, of an emotional association with, with uh, um, information and that then becoming knowledge, these are all terminologies that while uh, psychologists might have uh, or be perfectly comfortable with them. A lot of agricultural researchers are extremely uncomfortable with these kinds of uh, terms, and yet it's exactly in that direction we as a system claim that we want to go. And then the other thing that um, really occurred to me was um, um, the point that Javier made about organizational capabilities, and I spent a moment thinking about that. And, and one of the key things, I think, in, in all of these processes um, has to do with the capacity to listen, all right? And this, it's amazing how rare 
um, uh, listening capabilities actually are. But if you want to change things, you, there has to, really has to be that two-way interaction between those who propose the change and those who are, we're trying to change. Okay, and it, and it raised the question for me whether or not um, amongst its various institutional capabilities, listening was a capability inherent in the CG system. I thought that the questions about continuity that really came out in this group were, were excellent. Now, how, how do we, once we've actually implemented something, do we actually continue it? And, and, and um, Andre made a, a really important point about how much this costs to implement. And, um, and I wonder again into adjectives that, that a lot of researchers might be uncomfortable with, but one of the key ones is, of course, trust. And, and the point being made is that it is only really when a relationship has been formed between individuals in the CPWF or whatever organization it is that you work for and your target group. And actually, you, you increase the potential for change exponentially once trust gets entered into the equation, right? At the beginning of the process, when everything is so project-driven, there's no real interest in just wholesale taking on what, what you propose. I also liked um, the implicit suggestions made on several occasions about complexity and and I think this was also something that really came out in the plenary sessions yesterday I you know I don't know about you but Joachim uh, Joachim's presentation scared the hell out of me it was really it was a frightening uh, um, presentation and I, I just I looked at those slides as they one after the other came across the screen and it just looked so complicated right and I think that that's also something that um, when we implement our processes for change, it's incredibly important that they're sufficiently flexible to be able to cope with enormous degrees of, uh, of complexity in the arenas where we work. Um, and leading off this is uh, something that Baru often talks about in um, learning to innovate, is, is the idea of adaptive management. And it's something that you know, it's a it's a very ambiguous term. I think that it's only it, very often that, that that when you've spent two years muddling through, that you realise that that muddling through is essentially what adaptive management is all about. Um, but also within that is opportunism, and and one of the things that we found um, very much in our implementation is just how. Uh, useful it is in terms of developing um, your multi-stakeholder platforms and um, um, strengthening your networks is to be very uh, able to very rapidly mobilize $4,000, $8,000 and throw it at an opportunity, get your foot in through the door. That increases the trust, it increases the love, it increases the respect, it increases a hell of a lot of things if you can take advantage of, of opportunities as they arise. However, within all institutional bureaucracies, there's going to be an enormous pushback. It's against the contract, the auditors don't like it, and so on and so forth. So I often think that just by virtue of our compliance structures, we are inhibited from changing the things that we would like to change. And I just want to thank all of you for participating. Thank you very much.